All right, hello everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Oad, um, and I would like to talk with you guys about Foreman. Uh, so before we start, just for me to have a feeling how fast with which part of the presentation we go, um, how many of you guys heard of Foreman or use Foreman? All right, how many of you guys used it? Using it? All right, cool. All right, so this talk I would like to a briefly talk for those, or describe for those of you who don't know what Foreman is, uh, how awesome it is, and for the rest of you guys, I would like to say what's up in the new version that was actually released today, 1.1. Uh, so to summarize uh, what Foreman does in a very high level, we talk about provisioning. That's you know private, private, public clouds, bare metal, virtualization, all of that provisioning-related stuff. We have configuration management, uh, overview, whether it's uh, uh, reporting or classifying, I'll, I'll go in details. Uh, obviously inventory and to show you what some sort of a dashboard for your uh, configuration management ecosystem. And ideally the overall goal is to become some sort of a unified console uh, or an API endpoint that you go to to perform actions on your infrastructure. Um, so again, to Narrow it down, I think some of you guys saw this slide before, but we're talking about all the stuff that happens before you provision a system, virtual or bare metal, um, all the way for its initial setup and never ending story of its actual, um, what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so roughly, Foreman in, as a, in terms of architecture, um, this drawing basically shows that we have a user's some sort of user, whether it's an API user or, or you guys, um, log in to Foreman and then we can do all kinds of uh, various actions. Foreman um, has different modes of operations, that means you don't have to use all the various ecosystems. I'm guessing that out of those people who raise their hands, not everyone uses all of the functionality. That means some people use it just for uh, inventory, some people use it just for reporting, and some people maybe use it uh, for provisioning and Within that, some people use it bare metal, some people use it OpenStack, and so on. Um, so, we have the integration with Puppet here, where we can get inventory, reports, facts, all that stuff. Uh, we have the ability to provision, so we need to talk to various uh, cloud or virtualization providers, um, VMware, and so on. Um, and we need to perform on various uh, perform actions on various uh, subsystems in your infrastructure. For example, manage your DNS, uh, manage maybe your puppet CA, and, and so on. So this is where the, uh, the Foreman uh, smart proxies um, goes into. Um, additionally, we have uh, obviously authentication here in the bottom, and at the end of the day, Foreman is a database, um, database based on the database uh, application. So roughly inventory. So you can easily just plug and turn on Foreman and immediately start collecting information about your your infrastructure. We get all of the facts, your custom facts and your normal puppet fact, factor pa uh, facts. You can search, you can you know, drill down permissions, so if you have different custom facts that mean something for you, you could actually make them meaningful within the application. And obviously, uh, you can get China flash, which I'll show soon. Uh, the same thing for reports. You just enable reports. That's a, the, you know, in your puppet master configuration, you just add the foreign report and you'll get a lot of information of immediately visible uh, in format. That will be giving you an overall dashboard of what's going on, uh, obviously telling you what Puppet did. You don't have to log in just uh, to the system or to centralize uh, syslog. You get it all filtered down um, uh, graphically very nicely. Uh, you can also search very easily, so give me all of the hosts that have a failure or whatever conditions that you feel are right for you. Um, and obviously see audit log of the system change through time. Uh, you get summary emails, you get all kind of alerting, you can integrate it with Agios or whatever, um, and, and you easily get that information kind of uh, flow from one system to another. Um, additionally, we have classification, that's the famous ENC. Um, for those of you who doesn't know what an ENC means, it's basically a way to replace the nodes BP file with uh, some sort of intelligent uh, application that makes decision uh, in terms of a static file. So an ENC is external node classifier, uh, allowing 
uh, pop into ask form and okay, I got this system, what should it be do? What should it do? Um, give me the list of classes, give me maybe a list of um, um, parameters that should be available to that system. And obviously the environment. So you get a very simple UI to associate systems with their role or specific classes. Obviously we know all of the difference between your production development and whatever environments, key branches, etc. Um, and you can easily group your host, so you can make uh, definitions that represent something and associate hosts with those definitions uh, and you know, slowly build up some uh, meaningful kind of templates that mean something to you and you could then make other systems that look the same. Uh, we also recently added the Parametize classes about half a year ago, uh, which is in this new version. I'll be more than happy to show that. Um, so, I think it's time for a demo. Now, as usual, you guys know with demos, especially with this uh, interesting internet connection we have here, we'll see what, what goes. I do have a local cache uh, of my system, so I'll try, first of all, uh, to go over the, the basic um, um, what, what, can we, what can we see in format. So, this is actually a copy of a, a database I had, so the data is a bit stall, that means all of my systems here in the Pi shows us out of sync. That means because my I just copied the snapshot of the database. But what we can see already, um, so first of all we can see the inventory. Ah, shit, sorry guys, bad language. But I, I have some debugging code that running here, so you'll excuse me. But basically we can already see all of the custom facts. By default they're not that interesting, but we can start really uh, drilling down into, let's say, um, I can see here all the possible facts that I might I might care about. Maybe I want to see the client uh, version, so I can filter that. And here I'll see obviously a key and a value that's the client served here and the version, but that's maybe not in as interesting. So you could get you know automatically generated pie charts to see oh now I understand how many systems are running which version of my puppet uh, client. And obviously this works with your custom or, uh, you know, whatever uh, uh, facts you, you, you make and distribute to your clients. Um, so this is facts. You could go and make more sophisticated. You can make uh, queries like give me all the system that their fact value equals or not equal or like to this contain this value. All, you know, all kind of uh, special query that you can make very easily through the... Um, the autocompleter here basically tells you here you can make it equal, not equal, and so on. Um, same thing goes for reports. Uh, if we look at the public reports, by default they are sorted, uh, or you, you're only visible the reports that have something that happened, right? All the other reports are just random, and nothing are not that interesting to see. So by default you can see here that the first one here had some failure, the second one applied something, and you can just click on it and see what happened. And here you can see there was one error, one notice, and one warning. In this case, you tried to install Ganglia and failed for some reason. And you can see here, of course, some more details um, um, like that. You could also see uh, diff view here. Let me try search for message. And something that has a diff inside. So let's say a file was changed. Um, if it will play with me, right. take a while. Anyway, the idea is that you could also see the, the diff view. Uh, that means that the content of, so if a file change from, from whatever content to another content, you could actually see uh, the diff here. Um, you know, the nice thing is you know, because these searches are becoming pretty powerful, um, you can actually create bookmarks, and you can create bookmarks here that you could, you know, that are meaningful for you to you. Um, that will mean whatever you care about your search condition, and you can then have save them. So you can see here under, under every uh, tab we have uh, a drop down which you could easily just set up your own um, uh, conditions filters. Um, I have no idea. I'll try my other instance. See if I can ignore the error we just had. A second ago. Um, sorry, live demo, that's the way it is. Maybe my VPN dropped. Okay. Um, 
So besides reports um, and facts, I also mention maybe uh, as part of the inventory, you can see um, statistics. That's again kind of uh, giving you some sort of rough overview of what do you have installed and um, giving you some sort of understanding a little bit of, on your hardware. Um, some people like it. Um, you also have the audit log, which shows you as, as, as soon as you start using Foreman, um, you can start seeing all kinds of uh, changes that um, happen through the life cycle of Foreman itself. Um, so these are related maybe a little bit more to provisioning or, or you know, operating system or a new system, a new host. Um, but you can eventually, sorry. So you can eventually uh, get all of the audits that, that, that were changed. Now in terms of ENC, um, by default you could simply add it host. Now the, the UI changes according to uh, the mode you put Foreman in. So Foreman can work without provisioning, so that means you don't care about all the provisioning stuff, don't show me all of that stuff, or it can work with provisioning and then you get more drop downs. It's up to you to decide whether you care about that or not. But in, in both cases, you have the ability to um, assign classes and assign parameters and, and, and so on. And because the demo is a bit slow, you can ask me any question in the meanwhile, um, if you have any. So just class assignment is pretty simple. You know, generally, um, you can just search. And obviously, I just like Apache, so I filter down Apache. Is this is this size is good enough? I'm not sure. All right. Um, so obviously, this, these are the modules, and inside here, you can see the the classes. Um, and this is fully aware of the environment. So if I'm changing, for example, to the OpenStack uh, environment, uh, at some unless I broke something in my demo again, uh, should change all of this. Oh yeah, it changed already. Uh, so you can see here. Um, all of the OpenStack modules. It's a completely different environment, and all the environment isolation is kept. Um, uh, obvious, obviously, the environment is, uh, the, sorry, the public classes, this is a bit about uh, parameterized classes. So once you have a class that has parameters, you can see that the parameters tab here went a bit red, uh, and then you can start filling in all of the values, um, and they're automatically imported from your uh, Puppet um, manifest. Uh, so you already know, and obviously they also support, um, here's a bug in my version, but anyway, they all automatically support um, uh, arrays, hashes, booleans, all of that stuff. So I'll show a bit more about that later. But th this is in a high level, at least how class assignment happens, and, and, um, and so on. So coming back to the slides, uh, let's talk a bit about provisioning. So we mentioned public and private cloud, so to be specific, we can do, um, in terms of virtualization, we can do VMware, we can do Libvirt, we can do um, Revem or Overt, that's the open source version. Uh, we can do, uh, in terms of clouds, EC2 and, and Rackspace and OpenStack, um, which are supported. And the idea is overall that, and, and obviously uh, when also bare metal, and the idea is overall that the same process to launch a system is roughly the same. So Foreman tries to, to tackle all of the differences between the environments and to give the operator, because I'm assuming that you have a complicated puppet environment, it's not always you guys who deploy your systems. You usually give it to someone else or you want to delegate it to maybe some power users or maybe you build your own custom uh, self-usage self, uh, portal uh, to your own internal customers. So the idea is to abstract as much as possible, give them the same workflows, and then we don't really care where you deploy them. So you can easily migrate from one cloud to another, or assuming you know we did all of the details in Puppet, uh, you can still abstract all of that and let the users consume it without really understanding the differences. Um, and where we're talking about bare metal, obviously there's more details that they, they need to take into account, or virtualization of bare metal, that would be uh, you know, the PC detail, it would be maybe your TCP and TFTP infrastructure, all of that stuff basically um, needs to take care, and Foreman takes care of all of that. So, ideally, maybe <coughs> it simplified once the system is, is set up. Um, so, let me try to show a demo of uh, this. I am a recording. 
recording for you here. Uh, hopefully this works. So this is just uh, this is actually the older UI. It looks similar, but it's an older version. In here, where someone creates a system, give it a name, automatically IP address, and all of that stuff happens uh, without you needing to worry about that. Um, set up the virtual machine. In this case, it's based on Libvirt. Deploy the system. You can see there's a progress bar with all of the details. And uh, if you want, you can also see the system booting. In this case, this is a VNC in your browser, so you can actually see the system uh, deploying. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a Debian uh, preceded solar. Um, so you can see that at this point in time, basically, it's, it's called unattended because you're not supposed to be doing anything at this point besides watching it and seeing it install itself. Um, so overall, uh, the process is very similar and identical. I'll try to show you guys an example, maybe VC2. Um, it's nearly the same process. You go through the same uh, steps and you get at the end the system which is configured by Puppet running and reporting that it's correctly configured. Uh, I can probably just move forward a bit. The idea here at the end that this is a web server of some sort and at the end there is a web server called example.lan and if you log in uh, to that server, I'll just skip a bit more, if you open a new tab and you go the DNS is registered, all the details are handled and the server is running. In this case it's uh, another former user from a company called Yakas. Um, so that's about provisioning. Now, in, in terms of details a little bit how this happens, uh, we have to handle orchestration of various components. So you see, if you remember the smart proxies, we're doing some parts, the, the compute resources, in this case, uh, the libvir, the VMware, whatever, do, is doing some other things. So we have, we have an orchestration layer that knows how to uh, handle the uh, reservations and certificates and, and the virtual machine creation, all that, and also roll back if something failed. So it doesn't, we don't want to leave stale DTP reservations or um, empty uh, disks uh, of a virtual machine in your setup if we were unable, for example, to create a DNS record. Um, we also know, try to know, try to, ad to address conflicts. So if you selected an IP address, for example, which is used, or which is uh, has a, maybe a reverse uh, DNS entry for some reason, some left one, for whatever reason we try to offer you um, uh, a resolution path asking you whether you want to delete it or not and we try to be aware of, of these kind of details. Um, right, any, any questions so far? Yep? Uh, which operating system does format support? All right, the question was which operating system format supports? Format. Sorry. Yeah, so I missed that. Um, we do the entire Red Hat family, uh, Red Hat and Fedora and CentOS and all of those. Those we do all of the Debian family, uh, Ubuntu, Debian, and flavors. Uh, we have um, Sol um, Solaris support, so Jumpstart. We have SUSE support. We have um, what else did I miss? Um, yeah, sorry. No, no PSD. Uh, Windows, there are some hacks possible to implement. There was a thread on the mailing list recently uh, of some users that are doing it, but sadly there's no full... Um, and there's all kind of work in progress around other operating systems, but these are the major ones that most people seem to like. And we try, obviously if it's bare metal, we try to address by the native installer type. So it's a kickstart to precede the jumpstart and so on. Yep. Yeah, we actually started some work. We found the right tools. Um, so we recently, part of the things that are new, we added um, um, BMC functionality. And part of the BMC functionality, obviously through open IPMI or free IPMI, is sort of serial over um, LAN. And we found a nice way to transform it into a web so you can actually get a console. Uh, but there's a bit of integration work that needs to be done until you get it you know, as transparent as, as a click of a button. So I assume that will be part of the next version. Yeah. You mentioned that you have 
The question was, uh, I mentioned auditing if there was a compliance interface. Uh, com define compliance. No, we don't have that. We don't have the similar view of public uh, enterprise. Um, so, in general, Foreman is a community-driven project. That means um, if people want that, uh, um, usually there is a, you know, and collective integration was one of the uh, top five, I think, requests that came. Uh, um, I don't know if you want to mimic one-to-one -one what Puppet Enterprise does. I mean, that's different use cases or not. Um, but if that's what the community wants, eventually we could probably make it happen. Okay. Yep. So the question was how to handle provisioning with multiple NICs when they swap, I guess, from... Okay. So yes, the answer is very simple. Part of the new feature that came up in 1.1 is a token-based identification. Um, so we have, we assign a, a token for each system uh, once it's provisioned and then we use that token to identify. So even if it comes from another NIC, we still know it's the same system and we can provision it regardless. Okay, so leave some questions for the end. I'll, I'll keep on going through the slides and we'll come back to questions later. Uh, so, as I mentioned, Paradise Class Support, that's one of the most important changes that a lot of people wanted. Um, the idea here is breaks down into two. Obviously, the ENC functionality needs to be able to respond to the format that Puppet expects. That would be a, a class with all of the key and values, all of the parameters and their values. But it's not just about the format, it was really about the data. So really, uh, if you think of it, the idea is that you can define data to return, but at the end of the day, the data had to be, have some meaning. So we came up with a similar alternative to Hira or XDLOOKUP um, that was actually within format for a long time, but was not that expressed. And we came up with a way to, to be able to define hierarchical um, storage within Foreman that could be uh, uh, kind of compiled whenever a system is requested to figure out what is the right value for a given uh, parameter. Um, so, and, and on top of that was because we're talking about a web UI, it was important that we can give some sort of a uh, relevant UI with some sort of validations. For example, if I define that the value is a Boolean, um, then it doesn't make sense that you can put in some arbitrary string in, in that um, it has to be a drop down. Or if I could make decisions that say it's a port number, uh, the variable is port, and I want to be either maybe 80 or 8080 or whatever list of predefined values, I want the user to be able to select those values, not just allow some sort of general purpose uh, um, black hole where the user needs to figure out what are the values, the possible values. And that kind of was always a conflict. In order to understand which kind of value I need to put in, I need to go and read the manifest. And the whole idea is to give it to someone who doesn't necessarily need to know the internals of the manifest. So it gives the administrator, first of all, um, and I can probably show that, it gives the administrator um, the ability, uh, first of all, to decide which, which variables are interesting. Um, you know, a lot of classes today are, let's parallelize everything. And a lot of the times you don't really care about the default values of perfect. <laughs> All right, let's try again. Uh, the default values are, are more than the same for most cases. So first of all, you can probably, uh, uh, let's take, um, let's take the Foreman installer class. This has 19, um, 19 uh, parameters. And in here we can, okay, so this is the class edit page. You can see already there's a, I didn't mention it before, but there's a notion of a host group. This is the ability to group uh, systems. 
Uh, and we can see also that the, this specific in, uh, class exists in multiple environments. In this case, the formal production, the open stack, and some other. Um, so, in here we have a list of all of the parameters. I could filter them, let's say, filter them based on the environment, I could filter them based on name. In this case, maybe I want to care only about, I don't know, whatever authentication. And I can start defining things. Um, I could see here that the name of the class is authentication. I could give it a description so it would be visible for if someone else later on wants to assign it. Because they won't be seeing, this is like the administrative interface, they won't be seeing this interface. And then I, I, I first of all, I want to make, I, I want to um, agree that I want to expose this variable. Otherwise, the user will not have a way to assign it to a host, or that will not be visible to the user. So first of all, I can assign it. And then I can decide which type this variable is going to be. It's going to be a string, it's going to be a boolean, and so on. Uh, and then I can see what is the default value. In this case, uh, the installer, where we use this class, actually follows the parameters class button. That means the, the value itself, the default value, is stored in another class. Um, so I, form itself doesn't know necessarily what to do with this. So obviously you get, you get to see it, so it gives you some context, but not, not necessarily um, help you figure out. So you can maybe say, uh, if it's a string, I could put here ABC, for example. And then I have a default value. I could also define it as a required, um, and a required would basically mean uh, that the user has to overwrite this value. So maybe for certain cases, you want to force the user to key in something because it has to mean something. <coughs> Maybe you want to force the user to enter a description of the new system, or whatever. I don't know. It's up to you. And, and later on, there is a, a UI here to define the hierarchy. You can define here the possible values for hierarchy. So you can first match an owner, then match on a host name, then match on a group, then match on OS, and so on. So you can define that. And then you can define the various values for every match. Let's say, for all the systems that are owned by me, this is the value. All of the system that belongs to this domain, this is the value, and so on. So this is roughly about parameterized classes. Um, the same kind of UI also exists uh, on the other, so a simplified UI exists um, on the edit page, or the new uh, host defense how you provide it, and eventually here you can see um, for example, here you can see this is the puppet class that it came from, this is the name, this is the current value it has, and you can choose to overwrite it. And then I can say, okay, for this specific system, it's not, uh, it could be X, Y, Z. Right? So the user actually can overwrite it without going through all of the form or the previous screens and so on, um, assuming you've granted the user the ability to overwrite it. Um, so really trying to simplify the process for end user or just when you want to provision the system you don't want to edit five YAML files and, and some notes PP statements. Um, any questions about that? Cool. Alright, I did it already. Another big thing that comes up in Form 101 is the ability to support uh, multiple locations and organizations. Now this was not a trivial uh, um, thing to implement, but the idea was pretty simple. The idea was to give you a flexibility because form is supposed to be um, a unified place you go to, right? And you, you if you're a large uh, company that has maybe multiple data centers or you just distribute it across the world, you have maybe 50 administrators or less or more, I don't know, uh, you want to be able to start partitioning your resources, your various uh, domains, below, this domain belongs to this and this subnet belongs here and uh, you want to give it some sort of a framework when you say, okay, I, I, I know that this physical location has these uh, virtualization infrastructure in place. So basically it was a way to, for you guys to map your resources and obviously restrict down permissions and all of that stuff. Um, but the idea was really to, to come to a point where I could define multiple locations and then I could exist, I could, you know, as a user, a simple user that only exists in one, in one location or just be able to see in the various drop-downs only relevant information. Because, uh, for example, when I provision bare metal, I want to install, um, use the installation source only for installation which is physically located 
close to where the bare metal is. And I don't want to see in the drop down some public internet mural, for example, which might make sense in a different context. So really as a way for you to organize um, your resources and location and organization are actually two different things. Location is physical usually and organization is something like engineering group, QA, uh, QA systems, engineering systems. And then you can have a mix between the engineering systems and location New York. That's a one mix. Uh, QA systems in another place and so on. So you can have different views. Um, the idea here is that we have these new tabs here. Um, and I've just had a, a couple of systems. And you could associate the users with which organizations and locations that they belong to. Let's say I want to associate or current, my current view, I want to change my current view um, because I'm an admin so I can see all, over, all organizations but I can, you can see here that I have both um, the location and organization set and now I'm only seeing systems that belong to, to these uh, uh, to this, let's say, conditions of organiz organizations and locations if I'll change my location, for example, to New York I don't have any systems here, so I can't see them. Um, and the same goes for every tab. So everything in form, the dashboard, everything all of a sudden changes. Oh, um, um, like here's our instructions how to set it up. It's really not the you know, there's no data here. Um, if I change it back, I'll get all of the relevant data. So it's really about um, <coughs> giving you more power to expose Foreman when, when it's a large setup. Uh, ensuring that no one ever selects a combination which is the, that does not fit. For example, using uh, one domain and the subnet do not belong together, for example. Um, and, or maybe using a puppet class or a puppet environment which the user is not supposed to be using. And if you look at the, uh, the edit here, how to configure a location, um, you can here assign the user, you can assign the proxies, you can assign the puppet, you can assign the compute resources, and so on and so forth. You can basically assign all of the resources that Foreman knows about, and you can say, this actually belongs here. Um, and you can also say, I don't care. Like, I don't care. All of my puppet environments, just include them all. I don't care. In this location, they are all included by default. I don't want to manage them separately. So you have to, ideally, you have the flexibility to, to try to adjust it to your own um, needs. Now, I, I must say this is a new feature, so we tried very hard, we worked pretty much, I guess, a good few months on this feature, um, and it's a massive feature, so by, by default it's turned off, so you have to be explicit about turning it on, and um, we're also very interested in, in the workflows, so how people end up using it, if it's useful, and, and so forth. So, feedback is welcome. Sorry? Um, so, I'll, I'll touch about the API, I'll answer, I'll give you a short question, okay, I'll give you the short question, the short answer, and version 2 of the API. The long answer, uh, give me a few minutes when I'll talk about the API, okay? Uh, another thing that came, to, uh, which is new, is trending. Trending is the ability to trend stuff over time. So let's say you're migrating from one something to another. Let's say you're migrating from one puppet version 2.7 to 3.0. Uh, how do you measure over time how does your trend look like? So the idea was very simple. Let's create some charts and keep some, some, some uh, values over time. So there's a new tab here, trends. Uh, you can easily create trends. In this case, I'm following a fact-based trend, which is um, a client, puppet client version. Sorry for the debug messages. And in here you can see that most of my clients are actually under 2.7.18 uh, somehow. And over time I have some more systems, I install more systems, but I don't see any trend here. I don't see that I'm, the number of puppet clients is reducing, you know, the 2.7 something is reducing over time. That's because I didn't migrate to puppet 3 yet. Uh, but generally you could measure your own kind of trends um, and, and easily just, you know, just uh, configure them either based on, on facts and then you can just say, oh, I'm caring about the operating system fact. 
and I want to see the operating system over time. Let's have migrating from one version to another of the operating system, or you could trend, um, I don't know, things that Foreman knows about specifically internally, like a host group or, or, or things like that. Um, so that's about trends. Um, <coughs> Some other stuff that we added in 1.1, well, first of all, we added support for Ruby 1.9, um, since Ruby 1.8 is end of life, pretty soon. I think somewhere around, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think around the summer. Um, we had Puppet 3 support, that was some undertaking required to get that working. We have an awesome framework for plugins, uh, the ability to, for you to extend Foreman and have your own custom uh, logic embedded or additional screens, additional UI, um, additional workflow events that happens, you know, whatever. Uh, and quite a few examples of uh, plugins which are really interesting, like a single sign-on implementation with Foreman with other systems, or um, other uh, different views, like a radiator view. Um, so really there's a lot of potential uh, of adding of whatever your own custom, and we hope that it becomes some sort of an ecosystem for useful plugins around Foreman. Um, we also added the multiple NIC support that partly answer your questions. But the ability, and I can pretty much show that, but the ability when you create a new system, it's mostly uh, bare metal at the moment, but when you create a new system, you can simply add another interface. Um, and you can say, oh, this is a BMC, or this is a secondary interface, and just fill in some info here. And uh, obviously, we'll create DNS and, and, and so on for this entry as well. Also, excuse me, assign IP addresses, but really start to look at the various uh, interfaces that the system has as, as long-term support for other interesting stuff like giving your console UI and, and so on. Uh, we've greatly improved the VMware and OpenStack supports. So I think they're really useful now besides of having just a plain console which is you don't have to open like the vSphere uh, client on Windows, you can just do it in Foreman. But um, really now um, VMware works pretty nicely. I don't know if I can show that, I can try, probably be slow, but when you choose when you want to deploy, oh, in this organization I don't have, let me switch back, great, uh, let me just change my organization to include the vSphere, I'll see if I can demo that. So really, but the, the idea is that you could now just choose the cluster, choose the store, choose the, you know, all of the traditional, um, let me show it here, sorry. Uh, just choose the, whatever, disk size, network interface that you want to deploy in your vSphere and you just go install it just the way it is, just like any other compute uh, resources. Um, let's see if I can demo it real quick. I can't demo it later, but um, if you want to see it later on, we're going to have an open space discussion uh, right after this talk uh, at room 315, 305. Uh, so just come and we'll be there for a while, so just come over and you know, ask whatever, uh, and I'll be more than happy to show how it works. Um, all right, uh, quite a lot of things uh, added in terms of UI. We also added a, a proper API namespace, so before that, 1.0 and below, the API was always there, but was kind of secondary. Uh, and this version, we actually made the API dominant. Um, so we added a new API namespace. We also added uh, multiple versions of the API. That means that we can ensure that if you write a script that talks with the API today, next version of Foreman, it will also work. And we basically ensure some sort of an API compatibility. That means that version is going to last. And at some point in time, we'll be releasing a new version of the API that's going to obviously last for long, as, as long as well. And it's up to you to, at some point in time to migrate 
from whatever API we want to the newer API. But we'll make sure that the API is compatible so we don't break API. If we didn't break that much before, but now we actually uh, ensure that it works. And if you go to the new Foreman website, uh, the Foreman.org, um, sorry, yeah, I'm browsing through my phone, so I guess there's some, eventually some sort of limit to how fast things are. Um, then you could, uh, besides the awesome manual, you could also see here full documentation of the API with good examples, both request and response, um, for what you need to do for, um, I don't know, everything here um, basically is, is, is written. You can see the exact response that you get for every uh, API request um, and so forth. Um, now, one, one more thing, um, yeah, eventually loaded. Here is an example for the response that you get, the JSON response and so on. Um, now, one more thing uh, that is really important, and we saw it, I don't know how many guys follow Ruby community security vulnerabilities, but there are quite a few, including the notorious uh, Ruby Gems that was hacked apparently a couple of days ago. Um, so one of the things that we've decided with this release of Foreman is that we enforce um, security out of the box. That means by out of the box when you install or upgrade Foreman, you're going to get the most secured uh, 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 setup. For example, authentication is enabled by default. If you don't want authentication, you have to turn it off. The same thing goes for how the Puppet Master communicate with Foreman. It all has SSL verification, so it means you have to have a proper SSL, very similar to how the client the puppet client of puppet master uh, communicate. Uh, you can turn it off. It's you know you go to the settings and say it's disabled, but it's, you have to explicitly do that. Until now it was kind of you have to do the other way around. In this version it was we decided it's it's really important. Security is much more important than a configuration issue. Um, so expect that when you upgrade, read the release notes. Okay, read what's going to break because just the young upgrade, for example will probably uh, won't go as smooth unless you disable the, unless you use our installer. Okay, our installer try to tackle all of those details for you. Yeah, great. All right. Uh, okay, I got more, lots of more slides, but I think uh, we can jump into some questions because I think we're running out of time. I'm out of time. Okay, so a couple of questions and we'll call it a day. Yeah, any questions? Right. You see, you scared them off. Okay. <laughs> All right. So if you have any questions, come to room 305. We'll have a lot of open, open space discussions. Thank you, guys.